This video tutorial explains the basic functionality of our climate software packages that we have on offer for download. And I'm using uh, Climate EU as an example here, but um, the same <coughs> packages are available for other regions of the world as well. Um, essentially, you can do three things uh, with this uh, software package. One is to characterize samples um, climatically, so if you have uh, coordinates for the locations of your samples, the software can read out any kind of climate variable that you're interested in. This is mean annual temperature over mean annual precipitation for a number of uh, sample points here, the gray dots, and a number of planting sites in an ecology study. Um, the second thing you can do is create time series of uh, climate data. If you have a location and you want to know uh, temperature trends or precipitation trends over time, uh, this would be an example where we look at uh, mean monthly temperatures for February, March, and April over time. Um, so that's a second thing, second thing here that you can do with this package. And uh, last but not least, you can create climate grids. Uh, this is actually a, a little bit more uh, difficult, and I have a second uh, video that explains uh, that explains this in detail how to do this efficiently. But also in this one, I will show you how the basic functionality uh, is, uh, so you can get started with uh, creating those kind of surfaces as well from a, a digital elevation model. So what you need for this is the um, uh, climate software that you can download at uh, the University of Alberta and at the University of British Columbia. It's a collaborative effort. Um, and if you want to work with grids, you also need some sort of GIS. And it also helps to have the um, R programming environment um, uh, available. Uh, we're, you know, we're just using this as a replacement for Excel, essentially, uh, in this in this particular tutorial. So it's, we keep it really very simple. Okay, so before we get started, there's one more thing uh, that we have to do, and that's regional number formatting, especially if you're in continental Europe, uh, since this this example is about uh, for, uh, uses a European database. Um, you do need to change your decimal points from a comma uh, to a period. So this should be a real decimal point. You can do this by going to the control panel, clock language region, and then uh, time, date, and number format. Uh, so just change this to English Canada or English US, and uh, you are all ready to go. Okay, so let's start uh, tutorial. Um, I already downloaded the software package here. And if you unzip it, it looks like this. Uh, you should have three data folders, an, ex an executable, and a help file. Um, so we'll just double click this, and this starts the uh, program. And um, the simplest way to use it is just an interactive mode. So you can enter your latitude, longitude, and elevation here either in degrees or in decimal units. Um, so I'm going to do this here for my current location, which is Freiburg. Uh, that's at 48 degree uh, latitudes. Interesting, goes right through the city center. And uh, 7 degree 0.83 longitude. And then elevation is about 270 meter. And I can hit Calculate, and um, there we go. So these are all the climate variables that are available. Mean annual temperature, uh, mean warmest month temperature, and so on and so forth. So there's a whole bunch of them. You can hit this Help uh, button here, and um, there will be a description of what all the different uh, climate variables are. Uh, chilling degree days, growing degree days, heating and cooling degree days for uh, utility companies. Um, then there's a bunch of agriculture variable variables, a uh, number of frost-free days, frost-free period, and so on and so forth. Um, so there's a whole uh, pile of those. 
Good. Um, <clears throat> so that's one way to work with this if you just have one location that you care about. But if you want to process a whole bunch of samples, you rather read this in and write that out. Uh, so that's what this multi-location processing is about. And I'm going to do the same that we've done here for one location for uh, and create an input file that this program can read. So we'll do this by firing up Excel. Um, and the format is uh, goes like this. So we have two ID fields, ID 1, ID 2. It doesn't actually matter what you write into the headers, but the order is important. So then the next thing should be latitude, longitude, and elevation. And um, <clears throat> so we can say Freiburg, uh, Germany, Latitude is 48 degrees, longitude 7.83, and elevation 270 meter. Let's save this. Um, we have to pick comma separated value uh, file here. And um, I'm just calling this one input. <clears throat> and we save it in that directory for convenience. Okay, yes, no, so we can select monthly variables here. We could also select different uh, periods. You could ask for a uh, particular decade or for a particular year from 1901 to 2009 at the moment, or uh, future periods, so right now we have the uh, CMIP3 multi-model data set in here uh, for 2020, 2050, 2080s projection. For, but for now we're just sticking with the 61 to 90 monthly variables and we go through the same procedure, select an input file, uh, select an output file, so now it has this little M for monthly, for monthly variables rather than yearly. And we hit calculate and it's done. And we want to open it in Excel. And I'm just going to transpose this here so that it's a little easier to see. So that's for Freiburg, Germany. And um, we have our average temperature. Let's graph this. Um, insert charts. It's a little compressed here. There we go. That's a line and uh, let's do the same for precipitation. Insert charts, maybe a bar chart for this. <clears throat> so there are our charts of precipitation and temperature. And we can now see if that's actually correct. So I looked up a, uh, the climate of Freiburg on a, on a website as well. You can do a comparison here. They have the same kind of graph. Um, yeah, let me bring this in the front. A little a touch warmer here, but um, we top out around 20 degrees in July and August, and then things drop back down. So it looks like this is reasonably good. And let's have a look at the precipitation. So we're going above, slightly above 100 uh, millimeter here, and that's the same that we see here in, uh, let's see, <clears throat> that's in June, we have the peak and we have that peak here as well. Good, so that looks, uh, that looks like a decent, uh, decent estimate. Let's make this a little more challenging and uh, <clears throat> try to predict the uh, climate conditions for German's highest mountains. And I really looked this up so the 
uh, Wikipedia actually has a, a climate diagram for this, also have some nice pictures. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't be Germany, even though this is quite rough terrain. You do have a gondola going up there and we have a weather station there. Uh, so we have a, a reference climate somewhere here. I saw this. Let's have a look. There it is. So we can use this for confirmation. And this also gives us a position. So we can enter this in our little uh, input file. And actually, so that you don't have to watch me typing, I already entered this. So the position is given here in uh, latitude and longitude. And I'm, I'm just going to show you how to convert this to decimal degrees, so you know that as well. So it's uh, 47, uh, 25, and 10, 59. So you can simply apply a little formula degree plus minute divided by 60. And if you had seconds, you would just add plus the seconds divided by 3600. Um, so there we go. <clears throat> and these are the numbers I entered here in the first line. And I also put the elevation, the known elevation for that mountain. Now just to demonstrate a little bit the um, properties and the robustness of this program, I also entered the same coordinates but without elevation information. You know that sometimes you have the situation, for example, if you read data from a grid you don't use elevation information or uh, you might not have it. And, and I also introduced a location error here um, of about 1.5 uh, degrees. It's about 3-4 kilometers and again with and without elevation information. So let's see how this works. Um, we can run this again through our software, picking, well, why don't we just for fun use all variables. Normal period, take the input file, specify the output file, and calculate this. Done. And you can do this for hundreds or thousands or millions of uh, uh, rows, actually. I'll show you a little later an example of this. And let's have a look at this. So now we have all our information appended here. Um, and again, so that you don't have to watch me struggling with Excel, I prepared the graph. So I transposed this just as I did before. Um, first series is the correct location elevation and then we have this without elevation um, and then we have the erroneous locations with and without elevation. So let's side by side look at the real station data here from also for that normal period and uh, what the software came up with and you can see that um, so this is Okay, I have to move this a little over here. So the temperature, 10 degrees, minus 10 degrees is about here. So we start with below minus 10 degrees, we go up to about 2, and then we drop down to minus 10 again. And so which series did get this correctly? It's the original one, so with the elevation estimate. Got that right. Tops out at about 2 and falls back to minus 10. And amazingly, the one with the erroneous location also got that right. Um, so that's an important feature. It Essentially, if you don't have your location right, it would ask, or the, you're asking, or asking the program, if there was a Zugspitze at this location, at 2000, 900 meter, what would be the climate? And it does get that right. So it's very robust against location errors if you have the elevation right. That's nothing you can get when you extract such data from grids. And um, just how badly those uh, location errors, so actually this one, uh, the if, if you give your position to the nearest minute, there's already an error of a couple of hundred meters. 
And uh, so that's a big deal. You know, we overestimate the temperature by two to three degree. And if you have a location error, a real location error on top of this, you're out for lunch. Uh, so, so this is about five, six degrees wrong. And, you know, in mountainous terrain, that happens uh, very, very easily. And we should also have a look at precipitation. Uh, precipitation looks pretty smooth, so this is exactly right. Um, starts just below 200 millimeter here, has, a sh has the same shape. So it's the precipitation surface that we hear is actually a very sophisticated uh, prism parameter regression of independent slopes uh, model um, that's been developed, uh, developed at uh, Oregon State University. So that's, that's also a very cool um, feature of that uh, software package. Okay, so let's close this all down and uh, let me show you the um, second feature of this uh, package. It's a time series functionality. And I'm just going to do this here based on the same input file. Um, I'm just going to get the Freiburg as a second location. So that's uh, 48. 7.83 and 270. Save this. And let's process this. So we simply pick all variables for multiple years and it asks me when to start. I don't know, maybe we start 1930 and when we want to end. Right now it goes up to 2009. We should update this fairly soon. Um, let's keep it that way. And uh, again, we select an input file, specify an output file, and calculate the time series. So this uh, apparently takes a little longer. There we go. And there's our time series. So we can actually sort this by uh, location. And then we have the year. I'm just going to copy this and um, put it next to a climate variable. So that we can. Uh, Quickly create a time series graph. There we go. So that would be our temperature trend for. Oh, I don't know if I got this right. Yeah, I think I, yeah, I did this for Freiburg. <coughs> All right. Um, and now we can obviously also change which variable we want to look at. Let's look at. Precipitation, let's look at winter precipitation or something random. And there it is. So that's that's the way this works. Okay, so the last thing I want to show you is how to um, uh, process uh, climate grids. And um, I already downloaded a um, digital elevation model for the Alps. I like those ASCII files, so this gives you the number of columns, the number of rows, uh, the cell size, and uh, the corner coordinates. And then it's simply a big matrix of, uh, of uh, elevation values here. So we're going to convert this to climate surfaces. And we're going to do this with R and our software. So we have to create the same kind of input file that we um, uh, had before, and uh, an easy way to do this is to actually use R for this. So what we use is a library that you have to install. It's called SDM Tools, 
and this uh, can simply read these ASCII files. So we're going to read this in. Table one, ASCII to data frame. <coughs> we have to give it the file name of the data set that we want to read in. So there it is. Uh, let's read the head of this. <clears throat> so this is how it looks. We have Y, so that's lat, long, and elevation. So that's almost exactly what we want. It converted this into a uh, XYZ triplet. So this is my elevation variable. And um, what we're missing, in fact, is the, the first two ID fields. So we need those as well. Um, calling this ID1, and we're just using the row number as an ID. Of table one. Oops. What went wrong here? There we go. Okay, and we need a second ID. And um, I'm just going to call this ID2. And now we're going to bind those all together. ID1, ID2, and table 1. And then we have to write this into a CSV file. Just calling this input CSV and um, we have to specify that we don't want row names. There would be another column, so it might it would write out these row names here. Um, so we're calling this false. That should be doing the trick. This, this can sometimes take a take a moment. It's a fairly big file. I think we got three million rows. Oh, there it is. So we're done here. I'm going to minimize this, and um, there's our input file. And we can open this in Excel, see how it looks. OK, so I couldn't load this. We couldn't have done the same in Excel, but we have our two ID fields, lat long elevation. So our climate software should be able to read this. <coughs> So let's just move this over here, replace, and I'm just going to do the normals here. And annual variables, that's fine. And let's run this. So this one will also uh, probably take a while. And I'm just going to pause the video so that you don't have to work for wait for this. So three million pixels that'll probably crunch away for a half hour or something like that. <clears throat> so okay, it's done with this, and um, uh, so this is the output. I'm just going to rename this uh, to output and move it back into the folder where we work with R. And let's read it back in. Read uh, table 3, read CSV, 
Gott. Return and <clears throat> okay, let's have a look at this. And you see now we have <clears throat> all the climate variables we want. What we really need uh, to create grids from this now is the reverse command of the one that we uh, put out here. And the way this works, a reverse command requires still my x and y variables. And then whatever comes after the x and y is are the, are the grids that are going to be created. So I'm just going to create a new table for function of table 3. And um, we're just going to add the rows that we need. So we need latitude and longitude. That's a fourth and fifth column. And then 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 7 and 11. That's good enough for this little exercise. <clears throat> so that's what we want. And we're going to write this out. Data frame uh, to ASCII table four. Okay, we obviously made an error here, so let's fix this. Three. time it works. So it does require the latitude, the correct latitude and longitude information. So it actually checks this against the ASCII grid that we originally imported. And uh, if it's no match, then the export doesn't work. <coughs> okay, so it's done. And we can shut R down. Mean error precipitation. So I'm going to, I already prepared a folder here with um, GIS stuff, so you don't have to watch me click through this and import this all, so we can just display this. Okay, so there it is. Um, <clears throat> that project just picked up the MAP and MAT detail um, coverage that we just created. And just for comparison, I uh, have a mean annual temperature coverage at one kilometer. Um, same for precipitation here, this is for an area in the Swiss Alps. And um, now we can overlay our newly created 100 meter resolution uh, map. So for each of those pixels, I have uh, 10 by 10 uh, pixels, so 100 times the resolution. Let's have a look how that looks. So you can see that there's a lot more detail uh, that is actually there. And if we do that same comparison for mean annual precipitation, there's actually not that much more detail. Uh, this is essentially just the other coverages, coverage smoothed out. So what drives the um, uh, differentiation here in mean annual uh, temperature is the, uh, are the temperature gradients along um, elevational gradients. And, you know, this is real climate variation. You can see, uh, you know, vegetation zones that, that track these elevation bands uh, in reality. So this is uh, good for, you know, if you, if you want to, if you would want to do a local study in this area, 
this is the kind of climate surface you want to generate maybe to place your transects, your elevational transects in an ecology study or something like that. So that's simply a demonstration of uh, raster processing. And if you want this in full detail and see me struggle with ArcGIS and R for about half an hour, then you can just continue on with the second video.